Welcome back to the Lowdown on Physics. This is the second last screencast, uh, or the seventh screencast in the series on interactions of light and matter, which is Unit 4, BCE Physics Area of Study 2. Uh, today we'll be looking at emission and absorption spectra. So today, uh, before we jump in, let's just recall what diffraction is and, and what it does to light. Basically, if we have white light and we diffract white light, we spread out all the different wavelengths. So we, we produce what we call the spectrum of light or a um, you know the rainbow, the, the Roigebiv. And a device often used to do this is called a diffraction grating. Um, just want to get that fresh in your mind before we start getting to emission um, spectra of different gases, which is probably the, the core starting point that led to Bohr's work, which we'll look at later in this screencast. So emission spot line spectra, basically that's when you've got a gas and you um, heat it or you run a, a large current through it and effectively what the gas does is it will begin to glow and when it glows it emits a uh, characteristic um, pattern called an, an emission line spectra. Now what this what this tells us is that only certain wavelengths will be emitted from a particular gas. And where this occurs, or, or what happens is, each line um, of the emitted spectra will correspond to a particular wavelength. So we'll, we'll have a look at uh, some diagrams in a second. But um, more importantly is that not only that, but we have individualized spectra. Each type of atom um, basically produces its own unique set of frequencies or own different colors of light that it will emit. Um, so it's, it's effectively a property of that particular element. So in, in the case of hydrogen, we have the emission of four key spectra and all hydrogen atoms when under the right conditions will produce or give off that that emission so you can identify the gas based on which wavelengths it gives off so let's have a look here's a few different we've got hydrogen which has the the key ones from before we've got helium with more and carbon with a with a range of different spectra as well so let's throw in the emission spectra for a, a random element here. Um, if we now look, we can see the, the red, the yellows correspond, the blues correspond, the purples correspond. We can clearly see that that's the uh, line spectra from uh, helium. Okay, absorption spectra. In some ways, it's kind of the opposite to emission spectra. Emission spectra, we give it a whole lot of energy and it emits particular lines. In this case, basically what we're doing is we're passing the whole rainbow white light or the whole spectrum through and what we find is particular, particular frequencies um, are missing and what's happening is the gas actually removes those particular frequencies and these are identical to the ones that it gave off when it was given energy, energy earlier. So it's absorbing the energy from the white light um, corresponding to those exact frequencies. So let's compare. We've got the continuous spectrum, that's white light, the emission spectrum, and then the absorption spectrum. So if we pass that through this gas, then we would lose those corresponding lines. They'd be absorbed. All right, so here, here we are. We've got, uh, that's what we've got, hydrogen, helium, neon, and down here we've got white light that's been passed through. Again, pretty easy to, to, to spot which ones are missing, which ones correspond, so that's for a hydrogen gas. Okay, so all of this stuff here basically was the base for Bohr to work from. So using this and Planck's quantum energy relationship, do we remember that from a couple of screencasts ago? So E equals HF, the relationship between frequency and the energy of a given uh, photon or packet of energy. They, they, they were all the sort of the starting points for Bohr to begin his work. 
So looking at this stuff, this is, these are the things that he started to realize. And he sort of said, well, absorption spectra and focus predominantly on hydrogen um, could only, uh, hydrogen could only absorb a small number of different frequencies. And if we're do doing different frequencies, quantum, quantum physics, we're talking specific energies there. Um, so only specific values could be absorbed. He also noticed that the emission spectra showed it was also capable of emitting the exact same amount of energy that it absorbed. So it only ever did those discrete values of energy. We'll come back to that in a, you know, in a little while once we sort of look at his idea. So these are the realizations that he had and then helped to form his model. So next that he realized was basically if frequency and therefore energy of the incident light was below a certain value in the hydrogen atom, it passes straight through. This comes back to the idea of the work function or, you know, the not no amount of energy being absorbed if it's less than a particular value. He noticed hydrogen had an ionization energy of 13.6 electron volts. So you had to provide light with 13.6 electron volts of energy to actually remove an electron. So really we're talking a, a work function there of 13.6 electron volts. He also noticed that if photons were above the ionization energy, then they would continuously be absorbed by the hydrogen and hence be emitting electrons. Now these, these all give us a, a good, good amount of background on what was going on, a little bit of review of some of the stuff and try to tie the picture together. Really you're not going to get examined on, on these realizations and um, we're coming up to, to the things that will actually appear more in your exam. Some of the numerical questions will be later in this, this cast. Now, basically, what we've got to remember here is that this is this then leads on to Bohr's idea and at this point they had no idea about electron shells. So really they didn't, this was sort of the foundational work to lead to this idea that electrons were sitting in shells. So his main ideas, firstly, the electrons are moving around in a circular orbit around the atom around the nucleus in the atom. There was the elect electrostatic attraction, so the positive nucleus, or the protons making the nucleus positive, the electrons negative, that's the force that's keeping it in orbit. And then he also suggested there were distinct orbits that they could occupy. They couldn't just sit anywhere around the, around the uh, nucleus. They had to sit within one of these orbits at a particular radius around the nucleus which is now what we know as the electron shells. So basically the next step then was what are some of the more uh, common features that we notice following on from that um, is that, that an electron will occupy the lowest energy orbit available. Basically it's lazy, it's not going to do extra work if it doesn't have to. So where possible it's going to sit in its lowest orbit. In its lowest orbit it's stable and it's not going to give off any energy once it's stable. If it's in a higher orbit, it's going to give off energy because it needs the extra energy to be there. It's going to go stable, it's going to drop down, that's where the energy gets given off. Next idea was that uh, any, any of the light or the photons absorbed by the atom exactly equal to the amount of energy to move into the higher orbit. So if it wants to jump up an orbit, it has to be exactly that, it, and, and it cannot be anything but the exact match. Now you'll get tricked up, somebody's going to get tricked up with one of these questions where it asks it, and I'll, I'll point it out again later in the slide where it will happen, but it's got to be the exact value. It can't be um, a bit more than, it's got to be the exact value. And then the next idea was the, uh, the radiation that's emitted when it goes from the higher to the lower level will be the exact difference. Okay, So to go from a low level up it needs the exact amount of energy and then when it drops back down it emits the exact 
same amount of energy from the start to the finish. So however much it absorbed to get there, it's going to give off exactly that amount. So the model. Basically, he said if there's you know a series of energy levels, let's call it level M and level N. The energy of the photon that's emitted or absorbed, depending on whether it's jumping up a level or dropping back down, the energy of the photon is HF. That's the you know that's the quantum uh, mechanics we we're talking about before, and it's equal to the energy of the upper level minus the energy of the lower level. And here we have Planck's constant, 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds, but it's commonly quoted in electron volts. It doesn't matter which you use as long as you remain consistent. And then of course frequency is uh, frequency of the photon and that's going to be in Hertz, got to be in Hertz. So beware if they put megahertz or something like that on your question. Okay, so to summarize Bohr's model then, or Bohr's work, basically he observed the absorption and emission spectra and he accounted for those in terms of his energy levels. He said the missing lines correspond to the energies of light that allow it to jump to a different um, to a different orbit, and only light carrying the right amount. I can't emphasize this one enough. The right amount of energy to raise it to an allowed level can be absorbed. No other photon can be absorbed other than one that can raise it to the exact level. Now the emission spectra includes all the spectral lines plus more corresponding to the energies emitted as the electrons fall down through the orbits. Now it can fall from the top, top orbit straight to the bottom or it could actually drop down in partial orbits. So it could go from the fourth orbit down to the second orbit to the first, or the fourth to the third to the second to the first, the fourth to the third to the first. You know, some combination. So it doesn't have to drop down with the same amount of energy in one hit as, it, as what it absorbs. And since it normally occupies the lowest energy orbit, there's very little chance that when it's at a higher orbit, it's going to absorb another photon to make it jump to an even higher orbit. Really, it's only ever going to absorb when it's at its lowest possible orbit. And that's not always orbit one, because we know uh, different, different elements will have different levels of, uh, or different numbers of shells, electrons that are sitting in different shells. Okay, so let's have a look. What's happening? So we've got an incident photon. A photon of the exact amount of energy required is absorbed by this electron. It jumps from the first shell up to the third shell. So it gets knocked up. Oh, that doesn't sound right. It gets, um, it, it absorbs all the energy and it, it jumps up to the third shell. Now, it's not going to remain in the excited state for a long period of time. Really, we're talking less than a millionth of a second. Hence, it's not really going to absorb another photon while it's here. So it's going to fall to the ground state. The amount of energy that it absorbed, it's going to emit. So if it falls in one drop from the third to the first, the photon that it absorbed is the photon that it will emit. This is what we call an energy level diagram. So this basically shows ground state and it gives you the energy levels for each uh, different excitable state that it can go to. Now since if an electron actually gets free, we call that the n, n equals infinity or whatever, basically if you release the electron it actually then has energy. So zero potential exists here when it's freed but cannot move, which makes these all negative. Just be careful, sometimes they list the ground state as zero and go up to here. Either way, the mathematics, the way you'd answer the question is the same. Now, basically, if you have an atom, uh, sorry, an electron on the first shell and you want it 
to be released, it has to absorb a photon with at least 10.4 electron volts of energy. If it's got a jump from the first to the second shell, it has to absorb the difference between that, the exact difference. So the photon has to have that exact energy difference between those two. If it has a little bit more, it cannot be absorbed. Okay, it will pass straight through. It doesn't absorb part of a photon, it's the whole thing or nothing. This is a question someone's going to get tripped up on. It'll be in your sack, it's a good chance it'll be on your exam. You know, they'll say we have a photon of, um, you know, like seven electron volts. Which shell does it jump to? You know, it's, it's not going anywhere, it stays on the first shell because seven's not an exact difference from where it begins. Okay, so if we, just, just to summarize that or, or raise that, if we want to go to a particular energy level, that exact amount has to be delivered. As it falls, it decreases in energy, hence that, that number becomes larger. Now, just a, a quick example. What's the shortest wavelength of light emitted? Basically, if it's gone from here to the third excited state, now, careful of your wording here. This is the first uh, state, but this is the first excited state, second excited state, third excited state. Okay, so when it says excited state, we're talking about the actual level it could jump to. Now, this is useful to probably have on your cheat sheet because you'll get a question about this. If you're after uh, shortest wavelength, you want the greatest frequency. Okay, V equals F lambda. Greatest, shortest wavelength, highest frequency, therefore highest energy. So if it's jumped from here to here, we want the greatest drop in energy. So E equals HF, that's how we're going to go about calculating it. We know E, we can read it, that's the difference, 13.61 minus 0.85. We know H, we need the electron volt second version. And frequency is what we want to find out. So frequency, rearranging, equals E over H, but F equals V on lambda. So rearranging everything, we've got lambda equals the velocity, speed of light, times H, that's in electron volt seconds, divided by the energy in electron volts. I'm not going to calculate it. I want you to do that tonight. Bring it tomorrow, and we'll see if we can all agree on the same answer. Have fun.